Matthew 18, we're going to read verses 11 through 20, and then I'm going to pray, and then we'll dive right into our message. Matthew 18, verses 11 through 20. The word of God says, for the son of man, that's Jesus, is come to save that which was lost. That's us. We were lost. He came to save us. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine, which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. God doesn't want anybody to perish in hell. He wants everybody to be with him in heaven. He gives us a choice, but that's his heartbeat. He wants everybody to be saved. That's his heart. Verse 15, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, anybody have a brother just kind of mess, you, mess with you a little bit and do you wrong, do you dirty? He says, if, a, if thy brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Meaning, just go handle business privately. Don't blab about it. Just go take care of business privately. And he says, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. I mean, take care of it. Don't gossip about it. If he hears you, he repents. Good. You guys got unity now. If, but if he will not hear thee, if he's not, nah, nah, he's getting mad, then take with thee one or two more. Meaning there's power in, in other brothers and sisters coming to rectify a situation. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So that not only do you have support, you have extra energy and extra uh, mindfulness and, and wisdom, but if he says something again, should you have some other witnesses to kind of help, you know, verify what was said? Then if it continues and there's no agreement, it says, and if he shall neglect to hear the, hear them, meaning he's not listening, this brother who did, did you dirty, did you wrong, he's not listening, tell it unto the church, the leaders of the church, the pastors, the deacons, if you would, uh, so that they can deal with the matter so it doesn't uh, uh, mess everybody up. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and as a publican, you, you, the idea here is if somebody's not listening, uh, what's that saying? Uh, the one bad apple, don't let one bad apple spoil the, the. Yeah. And so that's what God's getting at. He's like, if somebody's a cancer in your life and you're trying to work with them, and trying to help and they're not listening, whether it's in the church, this is in context of the church. He's saying if they're not listening and you've done all that you can to bring reconciliation and peace, well, then eventually you need to have enough security and power inside of yourself to say, you know, you need to leave. I'm not going to let you control me with your, your toxic attitude. That's basically what it's getting at. And so he says, he says, verily, I say unto you. Now, here's the power that I want to get into. Verily, I say unto you, whosoever ye, uh, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So there's a connection between what you do here on earth and what happens in heaven or rather what is already happening in heaven and how you declare it here on earth. And I'll speak into that here soon. And he says, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree, there's power and agreement, a, 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 a connection, a collaboration, a cooperation, especially with, with believers on earth as touching anything that they shall ask. So it indicates prayer. It shall be done for them of my father, which is in heaven. So we see again here in the kingdom that God's in heaven. We see that there's a, we have a connection with heaven. We have a connection with our father. And then he says, for where two or three are gathered together in my, what does it say? In my name. Hey, aren't we gathered together here today in Jesus's name? And in his name, there's power. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If I was to call your name, typically you would turn your attention, right? If somebody's talking about you, 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 you incline your ear. When we start talking about Jesus, God in heaven goes, oh, hey, they're talking about me. And he really starts kind of coming into that thing. And so what he's saying is, I want you to know my heartbeat, how I love people. But I also want you to know how to deal with issues, confronting issues, dealing with conflict and maintaining unity and peace inside the church. And I also want you to understand the power that you have inside of unity with regards to prayer. And what I'm going to focus in on. Are you listening? What I'm going to focus in on today 
is the keys to the kingdom and specifically how God has given us the keys to the kingdom. And I'm going to make a connection that Jesus gives to us the power to bind and loose. And I'll speak into that in a very clear way to where you'll get it, you'll understand it. You'll not only understand it, how it applies spiritually, but you'll understand how it applies physically to you. I'm going to use the heart, the head, and the hand to really try to bring a great connection into your understanding so that you can use it. So would you all pray with me silently? I'll pray out loud. Let's ask God to open our understanding. Father, thank you so very much for the word of God. Thank you for your power. Lord, we're all here today. We're gathered together in your name. And we want to ask together collectively that you would bind back all of principalities and powers, cast out scorn and doubt and unforgiveness and railing and gossip and all the hindrances and blockers that that harm our spirit, our soul and our body and loose the blessings of God upon us. Loose the wisdom and the grace and the understanding and the unction. Uh, remove the scales from off of our eyes. Help us to understand the spiritual metaphor of the keys to the kingdom. But God, please, as we're, as we're asking for these keys, don't let us operate as a renegade uh, Christian doing whatever we want for the, 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 the consumption of our own lust. Give us your heart, give us your head, and give us your hand the way a king of kings operates so that we can embrace our royalty in a way that is so benevolent, dignified, and worthy of our calling. We pray, God, that you'd bless this time in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. And so what we're going to talk about is how to use your keys to the kingdom. How many of you ever went to the, the door, uh, a door before and you started using every key on your keychain, only to find out you didn't have the right key? And then you had to kind of pull out your wallet and kind of do stuff that you're not supposed to do, you know, with the credit card and trying to get in. And then you find out it's a deadbolt and you can't quite, you know, maneuver it. And, and then you got to go back and find the right key. Well, today I'm going to show you how to use not only how, what the right keys are, but how to use the keys in the right way so that doors will open in your life so that you can advance in the kingdom of God for the glory of God. And so as we're looking at this, I have a cross reference I want you to look at here in Matthew chapter 16. It should be in your notes as well. It's already typed up there. Matthew 16, 19, it says that he says, Jesus is talking to Peter here and he says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, I don't know about you. When I read stuff like that, I kind of get a little excited. I get a little giddy. Like, well, I got keys. <laughs> what can I do with these keys? What can I open up with these keys? How do I use these keys? I, I wanna, I, I'm very curious about these keys. And I, and I kind of get a little excited about when I read stuff like that. Now, when you're reading your Bible, don't just go too quickly. Slow down, ask questions. Ah, what is that key? Is that just for Peter? Or is it for the disciples? Or is it for us? I believe it's for us. I believe that Jesus gave all, has all power and authority, and he's delegated that authority. And we've entered into the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, but by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. Now, as you're thinking about this, he connects uh, these keys. He says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And then he says this, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, the keys are a metaphor for the spiritual power to open and close, to bind and loose. We can bind and we can loose what God has prohibited or permitted. Listen to this in scripture. Binding. The word binding simply means this to forbid, to refuse, to prohibit or to tie. You think about marriage. You're binding together in holy matrimony. You think about the offerings of the lambs. They were bound together for a certain purpose. You think about loosing. The word loose means to permit, to allow, to accept, uh, to set free. We want to loose the blessings of God, don't we? We want to see heaven open the windows of heaven and loose the blessings. Anybody want the blessings of God to pour down on you? Man, that's what I want to see. Malachi talks about that. 
And so when you're thinking about loosing, uh, you, you want to think about setting free. Now, I am set free. I am free, free, free. Man, I'm about to sing right now from this world of sin. I am free. Well, who set me free? Who loosed me? It was Jesus Christ. And it was the power of his blood. In fact, uh, we went over how we're kings and priests in the first lesson that we went over uh, on the kingdom. And I brought up this verse to you uh, in, in the first and second lesson, how God has washed us in his blood. And by the power of the blood of Christ, I am free. Where's my sins? My sins are gone. Oh, they're gone today. I am loosed. I am not who I used to be. I am a child of the king. I am going somewhere. You say, where are you going? I'm going to glory, amen. And he's already inside of me. And so you're thinking keys. You're thinking binding and loosing. You're thinking, well, how do I use these keys? I want to know how to use these keys. Well, in your notes, let me give you this. Three special key powers. Number one, you can, uh, you have power to choose. You have power to choose. Many people always ask, well, why did God do this? Why did God do that? Because he doesn't want you to be a robot, okay? So next time you get mad at God for all this stuff, for whatever he did, realize he gave you the power to choose. So if you make dumb choices, who's the dummy? It's not God, right? If I make dumb choices, it's me. If I make great choices, great, <laughs> wonderful, right? We have power to choose. In binding and loosing, you have power to mess up your life by what you put in your body. You have power to loose your life by saying, no, I'm not putting that in my body. Is that right? You have power to choose. And that is awesome, an awesome power. Number two, you have power to change. Listen, I'm not what I used to be. You don't have to stay right where you're at. You can change. I like what Jim Rhodes said. You don't like where you're at. You're not a tree. You can move. You can change. You say, well, I've always been poor. I've always had bad health. I can't sing. I can't speak. I can't play instruments. Uh, you can choose to change. It is a choice that you accept into you. Here's what I'm finding. A lot of people, they harden unbeliefs inside of them. Well, this is how my dad was. And I can't do this and I can't do that. And I'll do Here's what you're doing. You're binding a curse upon yourself. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so that's why when you're listening to somebody, when they're operating in a sub, from their, their, uh, their subconscious mind, their, their autopilot, if you would, and they're, they're, they're constantly throwing out negative things about where they're at, you know what's happening? They're holding themselves down by their own words, by what they believe in their system. And so you have power to change. Uh, let me give you number three. You have power to create. You have power to create. You know, God put Adam and Eve in the garden. He said, go ahead and tend it, keep it. They could have anything they want because they could have designed whatever they want. You had power to create what you were going to wear today. You had power to create how you're going to do your hair or not do your hair. You had power to create your, uh, your, uh, what, what job you're going to do. You have power to create based upon binding and loosing. Listen, I'm no longer a drug addict. I'm no longer an alcoholic. I'm no longer uh, 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 st stuck in sin. I'm no longer a filthy, foul-mouthed person. Well, how did that happen? Because Jesus set me free, and every single day, I use the keys to the kingdom to bind and loose in everyday conversation. Now, to the, to the young Christian, they have no idea what I'm doing. But to the one who actually starts advancing and they hear the pastor, they hear a spiritual person speaking and talking, they'll start picking up. He's moving his words around. He's changing his thoughts. He's rejecting that. He's putting this in. Why is he doing that? See, too many of us, we don't ask the question why. We just operate based upon tradition and what daddy said, mama said, and we're not using our thinker. You have the power to change your life. If you're willing, I, I often tell people, listen, I set before you a blessing and a curse. You choose. What do you want? And it's, it's really wonderful when people say, I choose life. I want to get saved. I forgive. I love. I'm going to go do this. You know, it's saddening when people use their power to choose not to change and to create destruction for their life. Absolutely sad. Absolutely horrendous. And I always walk away almost like... God, I'm giving them to you because they're stuck in sin. I've did, done my job. And it breaks my heart, but I, I got to go on. 
I got to go on. Why? Because I'm not going to let somebody else's poor choices stop me from creating the life that God wants me to create with him. Y'all following? And so you have those powers. Now, let me give you a disclaimer as I'm walking through this. Uh, is everybody connecting in? Is my energy all right? Am I too high or do I need to come a little lower? A little higher. Hey, uh, a little high. I got a few more gears up there. Uh, hey, I've been working on my singing a little bit. And, uh, and, and I, I'm not going to do it right now, but eventually you're going to go, wow. <laughs> you will go, wow. <laughs> and working on the different levels and holding it there. It's a blessing, kind of stretching out the vocal cords. Oh, yeah, I'm learning a few things. Now, let me give you a disclaimer here. Kingdom Keys are not given for personal lustful consumption of earthly things outside the benefit of God and the expansion of his kingdom. Can you all receive that? We're not saying name it, claim it, you get ever, whatever you want outside the will of God. Okay, that's just foolishness. It's a mockery. Any pursuit of temporal blessings disconnected from the eternal spiritual root, which is Jesus Christ, and his glory is completely empty, vain, and doomed to perish. It's short-lived. That's why the wages of sin is eventual death. It, it feels good, tastes good, thinks good for a little bit, but then it's destined to failure. And so uh, you think about this, okay, so I need to use these keys the right way. On the other hand, if I do use the, kings the, right, uh, the keys the right way, all earthly physical blessings shall be awarded, I like this part, when accessed with eternal keys of faith, hope, and love. Remember, and I love this, this thought. Remember, God delights. He delights. He smiles. He laughs. He sings. He's a joyful God. He delights in giving his kids good things when they are actually good for us and him. He, he wants to give you good things. He wants to bless you. It's like you, you want to bless your kids, don't you? You want to give them good things. And when they ask for something, you know, it's not quite. Uh, and then they get mad at you because you say no. Listen, that's the same thing with God. God's like, no, you're trying to you're trying to manipulate me. You're trying to twist me. You're trying to distort me. That's going to hurt you anyway. It's going to be bad for both of us. And so God, on the flip side, when you ask for good things, holy things, wonderful things, benevolent things. Yes, there's a spiritual blessing attached to it. But every spiritual blessing manifests itself out from the spirit to the soul to the body and has some measure of blessing in the physical world. It manifests itself out. And so that is just a quick disclaimer. Now, as we're talking about binding and loosing, it's, it's our declarations, not determinations, when we bind and loose are based on the promises and principles of Scripture. I am not just determining everything that I get. I am declaring what God says based upon the promises and principles laid out in the authority of the Word of God. Therefore, if you know the word of God, you'll know how to use the keys. But if you fail to read your Bible, you fail to study. Guess what happens to your ability to use the keys spiritually? You don't know what you're doing. You go blind, if you would, in some ways. And you forget the power. And so it's whatever we bind or loose on earth is already bound and loosed in heaven. Why? Because in heaven, it's perfect. It's holy. It's benevolent. It's kind. You say, well... How does that work? Well, when a man's ways please the Lord, he's operating in the spirit. Heaven affirms what it is that you're doing. When you sin, when you, when you fall astray and you, go, you, you do go your own way, you're putting a curse upon yourself. It doesn't please the heart of God. Are you all following? Am I connecting? Are you guys thinking? How many of y'all, your, your wheels are turning? Okay. Yeah, good, good. That's what we want. We want you to think. Now, let's move forward into this message, uh, and I want to give you first an example. I want to give you a biblical example of understanding and accessing spiritual authority with positive results. Look over in your Bible to Matthew chapter number 8. Matthew chapter number 8. You, if you're not familiar with this passage, this is the, centuri the case of the centurion, the centurion's case. Matthew 8, verse 5. And when Jesus entered into Capernaum, Man, I would love for him to come to my city. But wouldn't that be great? Hey, Jesus is coming. You'd be psyched up. You'd be like, yeah, I heard about this guy. Well, he comes. 
the Bible says at Capernaum, and there came unto him a centurion. Now, this is a, a Roman soldier with power and authority, understands how, how authority works with people under him. But he's also, uh, remember, he's a Roman and Jesus is a Jew. So there's, you know, there's some, uh, there's some, some disconnect there. And, but he doesn't mind. The centurion's going. I mean, he's going to see Jesus. And he comes beseeching him. He's asking, he's going to ask him for something, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. This, this centurion, we want to talk about a great leader. He cares about his servants. Just like a great parent will care about the plight of their kids. A great pastor, deacon, will care about the church members. A great CEO and president, a great coach, they will care about those who are on the team or the organization, and they will seek for their welfare and, and, and health and prosperity. G this centurion's coming to Jesus. Says, hey, he's sick with palsy, man. He can't move. He's grievously tormented. And, and Jesus says unto him, I love what Jesus says. It's like immediate. He says, I, I will come and heal him. There's no apprehension. There's no blockage there. Like Jesus was going to go heal him. Like, yeah, okay, I'm going to come. I'll, I'll come take care of business right now. And he responds right away. But watch this. The centurion answered and said, listen, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. So he's shown humility, true humility. But now watch what he says. But speak the word only. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Speak the word only. Words have power. You think about this. I'm speaking to you right now. You can't see my words, can you? There's energy flowing from me, from my mouth, coming through the air by way of sound waves. And it's, it's hitting a physical mechanism inside your ear that's moving the frequency of your eardrum. Not only the pitch, the tone, the spirit, but it's causing you to be able to receive something spiritual and it's connecting into the physical and it's causing it to go back into the spiritual energy of your mind, the electrical nervous system of your mind. And you're able to comprehend exactly what I'm saying. It's one thing when it's coming from you and I. It's another when it's coming from God. Now, you and I, we're, we have the ability to speak and death and life are in the power of the tongue. We get that power from him. You speak because he enables you to speak. This guy gets it. I don't know about you, but if I'm going to be in a room with people, I want to be in a room with people that get it. I really do. This guy says, listen, you don't got to come to my house. You just speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. You know what he's doing? He's saying, I don't even need your physical temporal presence to go there. <laughs> see, too many times you and I, we get so caught up in what we can see. We think Jesus has got to come do this or go do that. He doesn't. He is there already. He says one word and it is finished. He can speak the word. And you don't even have to see him. That's why many times if you start getting messed up because you're not seeing somebody physically, you forget that you can connect with them spiritually. Paul would often say, listen, even though I'm not there in, 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 in physicality, I'm with you in spirit. Hey, even when you don't see me, I'm praying. Connecting. Are you all following? Now watch what Jesus does here. Watch, he says, he says, speak the word only. And now he gives his understanding, his frame of reference. He says, I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say unto this man, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. What's he getting at? He's saying, I understand not only the power of words, but I understand the power of delegation. And I under understand the power of spiritual authority. And you, Jesus, there's nobody higher than you. So I understand that you don't even have to go there. You say a word, I bet, I'm sure this guy understood some things about the unseen realm. You say a word, 
Not only are you there, you can send an angel there. Not only there, you can say, and bam, that will happen immediately. Your words penetrate through walls. They penetrate through people. The faith can impact the biology of a certain person. <laughs> Look what Jesus does here. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed. <laughs> he marveled. Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Listen, everyone, I've been all around Israel 33 years. And I listen, I have not seen anyone like this guy. Nobody understands me like this guy understands me. I'm, I'm marveling at his faith. <laughs> and he says, I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west. And shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, what's he getting at? The Jews, to them, they were given the oracles of God. But yet they did not receive it by faith. That it might be by grace. And so listen, you might be here today in the building. But you may be missing everything. And he's saying those who think that they're going to get it aside from the spirit of God are not going to get it. This guy gets it and understands how spiritual authority works. Verse 13. And Jesus said unto the centurion, go thy way. Oh, listen to this. Say it with me. One, two, three. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. See, it's not what you say. It's what you believe on the inside. He said, I see that you actually believe that. I see that you actually asked for that. And according to your belief, he's healed right now. Do you understand that your belief can not only transform your life, but you have the power to bind and loose and to ask God for things that can impact somebody else that's not even in the room? See, when you start understanding this, your whole prayer life goes from level two awareness and it just starts climbing three, four, five, six, and it goes way up. Your prayer life will drastically increase. You will get up early. You will spend 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. You'll let, write out people's names. And, and listen, you'll start doing work in people's hearts and their bodies and their souls when they don't even know that you're in there working. <laughs> How do you think prayer works? You think that there's just a great disconnect with everything? Oh, pastor, pray for me. Oh, pray for me. No, listen. I believe that God answers prayer. How about you? I believe we have direct access. He says, come boldly to the throne of grace. And listen, what encourages me in my prayer life is I, I put the key in and I, and I go with God and I know the principles of Scripture. And the promises of scripture. And if I see somebody that's hard and unbelief and doubt and fear. And, and what I do is I go in and I say, God, I want to see that cast out in the name of Jesus Christ. And that, that, that spirit's hurting her. That spirit's hurting him. God, remove it and put power and peace and love and, and strength and open their understanding. You want to talk about prayer with fervency. The reason we don't see answers is because we do not know how to pray. You start learning this stuff, your whole life changes. Everything changes when you learn how to use the keys to the kingdom. I don't know about you, but this fires me up. Before you can fully appreciate and utilize and maximize your position of royalty in Christ, you must understand the heart, the head, and the hand of our great King Jesus. He has given us the keys to the kingdom and desires to rule. He desires us to rule in a manner that mirrors his purity, prudence, and precision. Let's learn all three and then use our keys with great results. Does anybody want to get great results in their life? Is there anybody out there want to see like God do great and mighty things? Listen, I'm not into just going to church just to, just to go to church and, and, and put my time in and not see a change in my life. That's vanity. Complete vanity. If your belief does not transform your behavior, then you're, there's a problem with your belief system. Completely. And listen, I'm not perfect. But he, I know the one who is, and he rules and reigns in my heart. And when my belief system doesn't line up with his belief system, he starts correcting me so that I can become more and more conformed to who he is. Anybody else like that? 
And so I want to see great results. I'm not one of those people who are like, well, I just pray and I just do my thing and put my punch my clock. No, I'm look, I'm here for a purpose. Hey, friend, you're here for a purpose today. Hey, God brought you here today, friend. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have a purpose. I'm telling you right now, it's about to go off in here. You have a purpose. It is not just to just exist. You are not here just to survive. You are here to thrive. You are here to expand. You're here to grow. You're here to use the talents and abilities that God has given to you. How far can you go? Oh, yes. See, if you will believe what God says about you, everything changes in your life. You will let go of the lesser things to go after the greater things. But if you're going to do that, you're going to use your keys effectively because some of you are trying to use your keys. But they weren't working. <laughs> You're like, prayer doesn't work. I'm mad at God. My husband, my wife, my job, my this. And all of a sudden, you're starting binding more curses upon yourself. More curses. Oh, my health, my problem, my back, my mind, my spirit. I just can't read. I just can't sing. I've just never been able to do that. You know what you're doing? Keep binding curses on yourself. Keep putting them on yourself. And who's to blame? Yourself. Not God. Are you all seeing it? Switch your thinking to actually follow the belief system of Jesus Christ and everything changes. But if you're going to do that, we've got to understand the great king. In his... Let's start with number one. Are you ready? Number one, purity. Understand the heart of our king. Understand the heart of our king. Now, we, need, we want to learn how a king feels. Whatever you wish for yourself, you should wish for all. A pure, forgiving, gracious, godly, kind, strong, and healthy heart to rule well. Isn't that God? Do you think that, listen, how many of y'all believe that nearness is likeness? The more time you spend with somebody, the more you start becoming like them. Their mechanisms, everything that they start doing. The more time you spend with God, ooh, everything starts changing. It's a blessing. Here's three factors of a pure heart. Uh, number one, mercy and truth purge, purges away uh, evil. That's in your blank. I started studying the human heart a little bit. Any, any doctors in here? Any, any doctors? I left my phone. Any nurses? Uh, four chambers? Two chambers? Four chambers. One's for oxygen. One's for uh, uh, blood. Does that sound right? And I, I started studying this out about the heart because I wanted to understand the organ of the heart. And it's fascinating to me how, do you know that you, inside your heart, there's, there's a, a spiritual uh, uh, electrical system? Isn't that right? That makes your heart trigger to actually beat. And that's why people have pacemakers when, when it starts mistriggering. And I got to thinking about how this might connect with God. And, 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 and listen, even doctors still can't figure it out. They still can't figure out how God's designed everything. And it's God's power causing our heart to beat. Here's what sin does, though. Sin destroys the heart and messes with the pure signal from God. Proverbs 16, 6 says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. Iniquity is like a, a sin, basically, rebellion against God. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Matthew 24, 12 says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You know what happens when you sin? It messes up your heart. It messes up the, the electrical signals that, are, uh, that you get from God. It starts grieving the spirit. It starts quenching the spirit. That's why your body, you ever look at somebody who does, dr just does drugs and alcohol and just messes with their life and is foul language, and it looks like they've aged a whole lot faster than others. It's because they're polluting themselves with iniquity. You look at somebody who's like, they've taken great care of their body, their health, their soul, and, and, and they're walking with the Lord. And it's like, wow, how do you even look like that? And it might be because they've been a good steward of their thinking and of their body and, and, and trying to make sure that they're not carrying, uh, I'll put it this way, blockers. You, I was about to get ahead of myself. Is that my phone? Oh, good. Can you bring that to me? Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, it's like we're connected. Thank you. I, I pulled this up. Let me see if I can find this. So we've got a right chamber, a left chamber, a right atrium, a left atrium, a right ventricle, and a left ventricle. The heart has four chambers, two atria, and two ventricles. Listen to this. The right atrium receives oxygen, 
And poor blood, which is blood that the oxygen has been pulled out of because it's already been circulated through your body, and it pumps it into the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps the oxygen, the poor blood, to the lungs, which the lungs oxygenate the blood. Without the oxygen, there's no energy in the blood, which can't fuel your body. The left atrium receives oxygen-rich blood from the lungs and pumps it to the left ventricle. The left ventricle pumps the oxygen-rich blood to the body. You know, Jesus, there's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. And so when you're thinking about this, you, uh, my, po my point, my sub point here is in a pure heart is understand the electrical impulses of the heart that actually makes that whole process work. It's God that makes your heart beat. It's God that's holding you together is my point. Sin will mess up your heart. Sin is a problem in the heart. It hardens the heart. It blocks the right impulses from God. This is why we need a new heart. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, a new heart also will I give you in a new spirit. Anybody out there, out there got a new heart, a new spirit? Man, I had a heart transplant when I was 15 years old. Jesus come in my life and said, let me get that messed up heart out of you and give you a new heart. You say, what? It's a spiritual heart. It's a spiritual heart. My biology uh, did not determine my destiny. Jesus Christ did. And as by faith, I have a new heart within me. He removed the stony heart of flesh and he gave me a, a new heart. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 20, 28, mercy and truth preserve the king. You want your life to be preserved? You need mercy and truth. And his throne will be upheld in mercy. God regenerates the heart. The Holy Spirit gives us the right impulses in the heart. Hey, question. I'll slow down a little bit. Shake it out a little bit. Shake it out. Shake it out. Come on. Shake it out. I'm learning this when I work out. If I don't uh, let the, the body uh, breathe and I just squeeze, right, it's not good. <laughs> the blood flow doesn't get to it. Sometimes when I'm preaching, I'm like, blah, 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 then you can't breathe either. So I'm learning. Where does the Holy Spirit live in the believer? In the heart. The spiritual heart. Fascinating. When you sin, what does it do to your heart? It hardens it. it. Hardens it. When you live in holiness, righteousness, purity, um, when you live when mercy, when God says, I'm not going to impute that sin to you, I want you to do it right. You actually do it right. What happens to your heart? <sighs> I see it. I see it. He regenerates that heart. He fills that heart. Let me give you number two. Grace and love ena enables good to flow. Grace is God's unmerited favor. And I would liken this to the blood flow. If you don't get blood flow to your extremities, what happens? They fall apart, don't they? They die. They, they lose the circulation. They lose the oxygen. They lose it all. In fact, I remember uh, with Cody Maxwell and Larry Maxwell, remember when he accidentally uh, got his hand shot off? Because his son understood the blood flow system, he was able to save his dad's life. There is power in the blood. In fact, I don't know how deep to go. I'm, I'm going to be done by 1130 is my goal, just so you guys know. Um, you can hold me to that too. Inside the blood are the cells. You want, you want, to, you want to clean your life? Clean the cells. This is why if you're bitter, if you're angry, if you're upset, and you start thinking that I'm no good, I'm unworthy, I can't do it. I hate that person. I'm jealous with that person. They got a new car. They got this. They got that. What happens to your heart? What happens to the blood flow? What happens to the cells? I'm telling you right now, there's a connection to what you choose and how it impacts your life in the blood flow. Now, as you're thinking about the blood flow, grace and love, it allows it to flow freely. What does bitterness and unforgiveness do to you? If I'm mad at you, you're not doing what I want you to do. What happens to my blood pressure? And what happens if I don't actually learn to be a mature person and learn how to pray, let go, decompress, keep myself calm. Do I get the power to choose some of that? I do. And this is where a lot of people lie to you. This is why doctors, well, let me give you this medicine, give you that medicine. All they're doing many times is they're taking uh, and dealing at, a, at, a, at a, uh, an effect level, but they're not dealing at a cause level. 
if you want to change something, you do it. You, you do it at the root level, not the fruit level. This is why we speak about. It's not about a conformity to a religious system. It's about an internal transformation with the root of Jesus Christ. Y'all seeing the difference there? And so when you're bitter, anybody bitter out there today? Anybody bitter? Yeah, I'm bitter. <laughs> Nobody raises their hand on that question. But if you're angry and upset at God, at somebody else, because they're not doing what you thought, you know what's actually happening inside of you? You're killing yourself. You're drinking the poison. You're wishing they die. It's like the dumbest thing. It really is, but it's like, well, I'm right. Yeah, but you're dying, dummy. Let it go. Well, I will choose death over this. Well, then die. <laughs> if that's your choice, you want to die over that, not actually live in love and forgiveness, that is your choice. And so I would much rather let grace flow through me and not quench the power of Jesus Christ because I know how it feels. It feels wonderful to allow the forgiveness and the healing and the enabling energy of God's love to flow through us. We're to be strong in his grace. Cast out all roots of bitterness. You know this. You have the power to cast out roots of bitterness. I cannot cast it out of you, but I can pray for you that your understanding would open up and you would be willing to allow Jesus Christ to let it to take it from you. That's why I can't save you, but I can preach the gospel and I can preach it in such a way that you can you can get clear understanding and then you make a decision to be saved. Isn't that right? And so each of you understand this. Each of you have the power to choose. You don't have to stay stuck. You can be born again. You can live uh, a victorious Christian life, but you've got to be willing. And this is the hard stuff. This is the unseen stuff. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and, and thereby many be defiled. You understand this? Whatever you harbor on the inside is going to come out. So if you don't deal in the unseen realm, it's going to come out eventually. This is my, my encouragement to you. Deal privately in prayer so that in public you will be healthy, holy, and very, very prosperous with your communications with people. But if you do not uh, uh, take care of your heart and, and you're not doing a good job with that, you will not do a good job with anybody else's heart. You won't. And so realize this. Choose peace. Choose to forgive. Choose to let the love of God flourish inside of you. Uh, understand this about rhythms. Holiness and righteousness preserve continual peace. Preserve continual peace. How many of you guys want to have peace in your life? Anybody? Yeah, that's why I'm here today, preacher. I want peace. I want peace. Not just a one-time peace. See, understand this. When you get saved, you get peace with God. Anybody saved out there? Anybody saved out there? Wave your hands in the air. I'm saved. <laughs> you got peace with God. But this is where a lot of people make a mistake. They think peace with God equals the peace of God for your whole life. They think eternal security means that, that, that you can just live however you want and let sin creep into your life, and you're gonna, you still have peace. No, if you don't have peace in your life right now, then you're, then you may, ha you may be eternally saved, and you have the peace, uh, peace with God because Jesus Christ's blood uh, atoned for your sin. But if you're just, if you're living in frustration and failure and uh, upset, and you're living in sin, you can get peace, the peace of God, but you've got to live righteously. Listen, you can't expect the peace the peace of God to come upon your heart if you're living in sin. It's like expecting daddy to be happy with you when you know you're doing something that violates what he wants you to do. Then you're going to go to him and ask for something. He's going to be like, no, son, come on. Get that right, and then I'll bless you. And you're like, Rah. So if you're, if you're walking around all, Rah, he doesn't do this, and I'm, well, I love him, but I do whatever I want. Well, you're missing the, the whole peace. You're missing the joy, man. Are you all following? I want to live in peace. I want to live in closeness with God. You say, what does that take? It takes understanding holiness and, and righteousness and, and, and the cycles of life and, and how to be replenished by the Spirit. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day. And listen, all of us are human in here, right? Anybody not human in here? <laughs> uh, me. <laughs> we're all human. We're all human. It means we're all messed up in some way, shape, or form. Yes? And you, you and I, we were... God has designed this universe. He's designed the earth with seasons and rhythms. He's designed your heart, your, your blood flow with, with, with a rhythm. Isn't that right? 
He's designed everything with certain rhythms. If you don't learn those rhythms, you will mess up your life. For example, if you don't learn how to sleep when you need to sleep, all the junk, the, the, the debris in your brain that's supposed to get cleared off when you're supposed to be sleeping and you're just trying to push through and push on everything, well, you're going to be having a, I, I'm tempted to say what I want to say, but I can't say that. Is there another word I could say? <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have a lot of uh, biological debris. Thank you. <laughs> Waste. Clouding up your mind because you didn't do what it took for the body to clear that out. And it takes trust to let go. It takes trust to be able to say, okay, I'm tired, I need to rest. But on the flip side, if you're sleeping and you're a lazy slug all the time and you're like, well, I can't figure out why I'm just so overweight and my, my body's not working and my, my intestines and my feet and I don't know why my brain is not operating. Well, what are you putting into it? Right? Well, I put good stuff in. Okay, well, exercise it now. Right? If you don't exercise the vessel, how can you expect it to flow? Are you all following? This is just basic stuff, right? This is just basics. You say, what was the message? Basic stuff today. It's just basics. And so we want to understand the heart of God. Follow peace with all men. You say, I'm mad at somebody. Forgive them. Don't forgive them for what they did. Forgive them because of who you are. A born-again Christian, listen, I don't forgive you when you jack me and mess with me and don't show up and you don't, you don't appreciate the value I put into the messages and you just do this. I still love you and forgive you, but it's not because of your performance, because of who I am as a person, right? My security is not built on any of this stuff. It's built on Christ. When the heart is pure, the vision is clear. When the heart is pure, the leadership is Christ-like. When the heart is pure, the speech is consistent. It's consistent. So that's the heart. Let me give you number two. Number two, prudence. How many of y'all have a beautiful heart out there? Anybody got a beautiful heart? I got a beautiful heart, preacher. <laughs> Nobody raised their hand on that one. Now, a lot of you ever heard people say, well, he or she wears their heart on their sleeve. Hey, sometimes that's the dumbest thing you could do. As you get somebody who don't care about your heart, they'll knife your heart. They'll attack your heart. And you're not living in a world where everybody is, you know, just sunshine and rainbows and butterflies and, and gumdrops. You're living in a world where you have got to learn how a king thinks. And so number two, number two, understand the head of a king. Prudence, prudence, understand the head of a king. Learn how a king thinks, he care, how he cares, how, how, how a king's heart works and, and how they think about the future. I've got some Proverbs there. You go home and study them. Pro, I'll read them to you, okay? The wisdom of the prudent. You say, what, is a prudent, pr, what does prudent mean? It means somebody who is very insightful, keen, looking into the future. Sometimes people say, well, how do you know that's going to happen? Because I know the Bible. People and, and circumstances change, but do you know what stays the same? The word of God. And when you're walking in the spirit and somebody's choosing sin over and over again, I can say, ah, unforgiveness, going to destruction. Unforgiveness, you're going to mess up your marriage. Ah, oh, uh, cheating on your boss. You're going to lose out blessings. Ah, stealing over here. It's not going to go good for you. <laughs> Why? Because I understand how the spiritual kingdom works. And that's how you can begin to see how the future will unfold for somebody. You set before them the blessing and the curse. So a prudent person, the, the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. But the folly of fools is deceit. Proverbs 14, 15, the simple believeth every word. Hey, you, you ever heard, uh, ever been gullible before? Well, I just, I just... I just believed him. Well, a king can't just believe everybody. You'll be deceived. A prudent man looks well to his goings. You ever, anybody ever play chess? If you're going to be good at chess, you can't just look at one move at a time. Some of you guys, listen, you're living one move at a time. You're living one move at one paycheck at a time. And you're going, well, I can't figure out why I don't have any more money. Well, because you keep spending it all, you idiot. And I mean that in the most Christ-like way. <laughs> well, you're hardening an unbelief inside of me. Well, don't operate in the flesh. Operate in the spirit and have some temperance, please. You can be tempered. How did I do there? Did I, did I redeem it? <laughs> the prudent man looketh well to his goings. Proverbs 16, 21 says, The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of his lips increaseth learning. 
Proverbs 18, 15, the heart of the prudent getteth knowledge. I need to learn. I need to learn how to be, to grow and be better. The ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. Proverbs 22, 3, a prudent man, listen to this. A prudent man, think about the chest now. A prudent person, it says, a prudent man foreseeth evil. Anybody play chess out there? Just raise your hand just so I can see who I'm talking to. The rest of you all, can, you can go along for the ride on this one. You can see when the enemy's setting up a strategy to tackle something, right? That's what you ha- how you have to operate with your spirit, with your soul, and with your body. If you don't start looking multiple moves ahead and not get, listen, and I'm not talking about getting frustrated because some of us, we get all whacked out and frustrated when it doesn't happen the way we want. This is a process. You've got to be able to foresee, oh, I see the evil. So if you see that you're going to, that there's buses going down the road and you keep stepping out, wow, wow, I can't imagine why I just got hit. You've got to start looking and thinking like a king. A king will look and go, nope, I see that, that, that. I walked around it. I got it from a different perspective. Yep. You say, what does that require? It requires you to slow down. You actually have to use your, your thinker. You have to process on the decisions of not just how you're feeling, but what you're thinking and have a paradigm shift. And so you want to foresee the evil so you can hide yourself and make some different decisions. Here's five senses of a prudent head. Number one, eyes, eyes, be watchful and overseer looking. Jesus put it this way. Be wise as a serpent. You have listen, you have got to use your eyes. He gave them to you for a reason. You can tell a whole lot about somebody when you look at their countenance, when you look at how they're, how they're carrying themselves. You, you can tell a lot with their gait. You can see with their countenance. We were at Chick-fil-A yesterday, and the countenance, the guy was at, uh, he was down. He's like, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. I'm like, and I tried to like, I was getting with, I was going to get in him a little bit. Like, no, dude, you're working. You better get, get yourself going. You're representing this company, you know. And, and so by the time my conversation, he was, you know, sparked back up it, it, because he needs, to, he needs to do a good job, Right? And, but if you start, if, if you're not using your eyes, you're going to miss things. Number two, ears, ears, listening to, listen to this, listening to words, spirit, cares, concerns, counsel. You can grab a lot of information off of people if you will be consciously aware of the words and their cares and concerns that they're saying. You can hear, are they, are they hardening themselves in unbelief or are they creating faith? and about to make some huge changes in a positive way. Let me give you number three, their mouth, their mouth. When you think about your mouth, how many of y'all getting hungry? Anybody? Oh, yeah. Come on. It's almost lunchtime. I'm excited about that. Your mouth. With your mouth, you taste fruit, the fruit of words, spirit, efforts, actions. Checking, you say, what do you mean with your mouth? Listen, you've got to be able to taste the reputation, track record of success with people. You've got to be able to kind of like, okay, you know, this person, they just kind of put a bitter, you know, you know, you know anybody who's real um, cynical, sarcastic, gossipy? That's a bitter taste. <laughs> you know why they're, you know, here, here's the real question. Why do they operate in cynicism, sarcasm, and gossip and kind of go that? Because they're, they're hurting on the inside. When the fruit is tasting bad, it's because the root is bad. Change the root, you change the fruit. Come on. I'm telling you, dropping some nuggets today, huh? Yeah, I can feel it. I can taste it. It's good. Number four, nose. Nose. The, smelling the attitude and fragrance. You ever go by somebody, you sit next to them, you go, oof. They don't, they don't smell so good. When you got, you got to use your nose. It, 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 are they taking care of themselves? Is there quality? We say it this way. Did they pass the sniff test? Because they might, they, might, they might talk a good game. They might look good. Get a little closer. Whoa. They, they're not taking care of their hygiene. Or, whoa, they're smoking a little bit of something else. Whoa. I don't know what that smell was coming off of them. Or... They don't wash their clothes or, you know what, they're not taking, and here's what that does. As a king, it shows you who you're working with. You need to know who you're working with. Are you following? 
But perhaps this is the biggest and best one for all of us to be aware of. Number five, the mind. The mind. See, all these factors, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your nose, they come in, and the way you take sight and turn it into insight is through the mind. See, some of us, we live the same year of Christianity. You've lived the same year over and over. You've not changed. Some of you, you've got 20 years of Christianity, but there's nothing changing. Because you, don't, you have not yet learned how to harness your lessons and change your life with it. Some of you, you've learned how to take sight, all these, all these uh, uh, senses, and bring them into your mind and actually learn the lessons. The mind is the, way, is the place of thinking with all facts and due diligence. It's transforming all information into insightful strategic decisions from God's word. It's factoring the truth and faith, analyzing spirit and word for the best possible outcome. When you actually start meditating on the scripture and your life and people, all of a sudden your mind will go to work for you because God gave you a mind, but you've got to be willing to use it. Well, I told uh, the church on Wednesday night, Hitler said one of the best things, and I'm paraphrasing what he said because I, I don't have it written down, but he said something to the effect, one of the, one of the greatest things for rulers is that the people don't think. You've got to think, brother. You've got to think, sister. This is your life. This is your time for such a time as this. This is your family. This is your finances. This is your future. This is your life. Listen, this is your time. God brought you to the kingdom for such a time as this. Don't be a pushover. Don't be weak-willed. Step up and use all the factors with your mind and embrace the power of God for your life. Embrace the royalty. Don't be stuck. Stuck stinks. Engage with all the abilities that God has given to you. And I'm telling you what, when you use the heart of a king and you use the, the head of a king, then you can get in there, number three, and you can understand the hand of a king. The hand of a king. We want to learn how a king acts. Let's see how God works and learn to act like him. Here's four abilities of precise hands. Number one, skillful. How many of y'all want somebody, uh, a surgeon doing heart surgery on you that just kind of a, uh, doesn't smell good, kind of disheveled and shows up late, doesn't do his hair, and doesn't do her hair, and, and uh, 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 didn't do any education? You'd be like, no way, get away from me. Let me tell you something. You need to treat your life like it's the greatest gift that God's given to you. And listen, you have talents, but you need to take your talents and actually turn them into skills. Skills are, you're born with talents. You're, you're, you're gifted with it. But you've got to learn the skills to get better. Learning, uh, getting from a place of not being an amateur to saying, I'm going to go to a spot of mastery, of high degree of proficiency to become an expert. How many of you all know that God's an expert? That's why I love him. <laughs> he knows how to handle everything. I ask him a question. I sit and listen. He knows the answer. <laughs> is anybody else excited about God like I am? Or is it just me? <laughs> I'm telling you what. He answers. He is skilled. You ask him about something, he will educate you. He will teach you. He will guide you. The Bible says this. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. The Bible says of the sons of Reuben and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh, they were so talented and skilled with their with all that they were doing. They were skillful in war. I mean, they were straight using right hand, left hand, axe, weapon, bam, bam. You ever seen people like that? Like, man, they're doing this, they're doing that, they're doing that because they developed their skills. Listen, somewhere in Christianity, we started real, thinking it was cool to be a, to be a lame loser. Somewhere inside, we're like, oh, well, I don't, I don't think I'm going to do No, use what you got. Develop what you got. Maximize it for the kingdom. Get skillful in every endeavor that God puts upon you. Be instructed so you can be a blessing to others. Number two, I'm hustling. I got to slow it down on this point. Coming back in. Number two, gentle. <laughs> you got to be skillful. Then you got to be gentle. Kind, amiable, soft, temperate, controlled, collected, sensitive, gradual. You know, God, it's by God's gentleness, he makes you and I great. The servant of the Lord, any servants of the Lord out there? The servant of the Lord can't strive. Listen, you see me up here preaching, but when I'm working with people, I've got to be very calm and very skilled listening to words. And, and guiding their heart. There's a difference in, in declaring the word of God and then working one-on-one. -on -one. Gentleness. Is how we help people. Speak evil of no man. Be gentle. The wisdom of, from above. You know what it is? 
gentle. It's gentle. So you've got to be skillful. You've got to be gentle. Number three, you've got to be valiant. The, the hand of a king is valiant. You've got to be courageous. If you don't stand up for your home, the enemy will take it. If you don't stand up for your finances, the enemy will take it. If you don't stand up for your marriage, the enemy will take it. You don't stand up for this church, the enemy will try to take it. You've got to be courageous, brother. You've got to be courageous, sister. You've got what it takes. you just got to use it. You've got to step in. Like God says, the right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. I love one of my favorite players in the Bible. Y'all got any favorite players? I love Beniah. Beniah. You know, the Bible says this. He did many acts. He went and he slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. Dude was Pump, jack, valiant, courageous, brave. I don't care if it's rain. I don't care if it's snowing. I don't care if they're lying. Get me in there. I'll rip him to shreds. That ought to be your heart, sis. That ought to be your heart. Something's happening in your life. You ought to have the power of God to say, I'm going to be courageous. Number four, mighty. Mighty. Superior power and strength. The strong hand of God, the mighty hand of God delivered us. Today in closing. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. Can I say this to you in closing? Now that you know how a king feels, thinks, and acts, let's use our keys to the kingdom in a manner that binds and looses according to the heart, head, and hand of God. Do this, and you shall see great victories all the days of your life and forevermore. Now, my question to you is, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to use the keys? Let me ask you this question. Do you understand now how to use the keys? Just, just kind of go like this. Do it a little bigger so I can see who got it. Awesome. Now that you know how to use the keys, if you have sin or unbelief or unforgiveness or doubt or fear inside your heart, won't you hit the altar and say, God, I'm casting that out from me. Forgive me. Take it from me. And don't just stay in the negative, the casting out. Ask him to lose the peace and the grace and the strength and the understanding inside of you. You do that, friend, you become very, very powerful. Not just for yourself, but you can pray for others like the centurion too and see some great mighty things done. Amen?